Hi everyone, this is Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein, and together with ChessLecture.com, I would like to welcome you to lecture number three of the series Think Like a Grandmaster. In today's lecture, I want to talk about my recent game against I'm White, against Alex Yermolinsky, who is a very strong Grandmaster and now resides in San Francisco. And this game took place at a recent tournament called American Open. So let's begin. I'm white and I played e4. Alex is well known for his skill in Sicilian defense and he chooses c5. I play the main line, knight f3, d6, d4, c takes d, knight takes d4, knight f6, knight c3 and knight c6. So this variation after bishop g5 is called the Rouser variation of the Sicilian defense. Now the main idea why white plays bishop g5 is to force black to play e6 as this is really the only reasonable move in this position and now white can develop quickly and I played queen d2. This is all theory and the main idea is to castle long. Now black on the other hand has a very powerful but a small so to speak center with the d6 and e6. And black's plan is to quickly castle after bishop e7 and castles and try to play on the queen side to try to create an attack on my king. So let's see what happens. Bishop e7, white castles long, and now Alex plays knight takes d4. Now this is a typical exchange and these types of structures basically black's plan is to try to create a pawn storm on the queen side with a6, b5. So that's the reason why they usually exchange knight on d4. And at the same time, notice that it's really hard for black to develop his light square bishop. So after a6, b5, without the knight on c6, bishop will be on b7, and a very nice and powerful diagonal. Here, normally the main line is f4, after black castles, of course. This is the main line. But I wanted to opt for a different plan. I wanted to opt for a different plan. I wanted to play f3. And let me explain to you why I decided to play this move. Now, f4 basically leads to a well-known position where it's really hard for white to start the kingside storm with g4 and h4 because the bishop on g5 is on the way. After f3, however, it's much simpler to play g4 as well as h4 and at the right moment the bishop can either retreat to e4, e3 or capture the knight of f6 so it keeps the pressure on. At the same time, after f3, why defends his pawn on e4 and anticipates the g4 push. So you see f3 is sort of like building a small bind to start the attack. This idea is very characteristic in openings such as the English attack in the Nidorf or in the main line the Yugoslav variation of the dragon. So let's see what Alex plays. He plays a6 with the simple idea to play b5 to develop his bishop and to get the initiative going on the queen side. Now you see my bishop here on g5 feels kind of loose. Right now there are no good retreats with the knight because after bishop takes e7 I'm gonna hit the queen. But potentially I want to have my bishop defended so I start out my attack with h2 to h4. The bishop is nice nicely defending on g5 
At the same time, I'm ready to start my talk with sometimes either H5 or G4. So black plays B5. And now the question, how does white continue his attack? So let me speak a few words about this position. How would you access it? How would you find the plans for either side? And what goes through Grandmaster's mind when one looks at it? So the first thing that comes to mind is that the kings are placed on the opposite side of the board. So that means whoever starts his attack first will have the advantage. On the other hand, it's not very easy for either side to push his pawns because my bishop is blocking my g2 pawn from going to g5. And black is really quite behind in development to start pushing his a6 and b5 pawns even further. So as you can see, there is some kind of small equilibrium reached in terms of pushing the pawns. Now, in terms of the center, let's ask the question, who has control over the center? Although white has a very powerful queen on d4 and pawn on e4, it's really, the center doesn't really belong to white because white always has to anticipate the th thrust with either e5 or potentially with d5. So these two thrusts in the center are the main plan for black to get a good game. So while white keeps his eye on the king side, he also has to keep his eye on the, on the center and the queen side to make sure black doesn't get a very powerful position after e5 or d5 going. At the same time, the knight on c3 is kind of misplaced. Although it does control the d5 square, but it's not really helping white in the attack. At the same time, the bishop on f1 is not really in the game. It ne really needs to belong on d3. So keeping all of these ideas in mind, I play the move queen to d2. So let's ask, why did I play that move? Well, potentially, black can play e5. And at the same time, I am getting ready for moving my knight to e2 and d4. So after black plays bishop b7, bishop d3, developing my bishop, rook c8, knight e2. So you see I'm getting ready to put my knight on d4. Queen c7, knight d4, rook fd8, and king b1. So all of these moves are standard theory. They could happen in a different move order, but the main idea is that white has reached his ideal setup. The king on b1 is basically a prophylactic move. Bishop on d3 is eyeing the king side. The knight on d4 is the most powerful piece for white right now because it keeps the whole position intact. Now black also finished his development, put his rook on half open file on c8 and another one on, on d8 to try to prepare a thrust in the middle with d5. And let's ask ourselves a question. Can black play d5 or e5 right away? So for now, Let's take a look at d5 move. The main idea of white setup is not to allow d5 by meeting d5 with e5. This is a well-known pawn sacrifice, but in reality it's not a sacrifice, it's a trap. Because if black takes, queen takes e5, he loses a queen after bishop f4, queen takes knight, bishop takes pawn, check. So that means black has to retreat his knight. But this only makes black, black's position even worse. Not only did black completely isolate his bishop, bishop on d3 is now very powerful. And now white can simply continue rolling his pawns 
on the king side. So d5 is not possible at all. Let's ask ourselves a question. What about e5? Well, that's the whole point of having the knight on d4. Now, after knight f5, black is really feeling trouble allowing such a powerful knight on f5. So that's why Alex Yermolinsky plays queen b6. The main idea is try to misplace or force this knight to move away from d4. I simply play bishop e3, defending the knight and having a threat of knight jumping out, either to e6, b5, or f5. And now, really, black has no other move than to retreat to c7. So this is simply a loss of a tempo, but in reality, it was really hard for black to strengthen his position. Because if we go back, d5 doesn't work, e5 doesn't work, h6 is really too weakening. There are no other interesting moves other than knight e8, which is basically not doing much. I can still play g4. and simply get a good game. So let's go back to the game. So this position could happen through various transpositions of moves. I could have played king b1 earlier, but doesn't matter. After queen b6, bishop e3, queen c7, we reached another critical position. Well, now black is ready to push e5. D5 is still not, not, not good because of E5. And then the queen is going to get trapped again. And also black has opened another option to play knight to D7 with the idea to play either D5 or knight E5 or knight C5. So you see, now black has an interesting option later on to play knight D7. But in reality, black has just lost a tempo. And we know that in these types of positions with opposite color bishop, sorry, opposite uh, castle, and whoever is first will dominate the game. So after g4, it's clear that white's attack is first. Alex plays e5, allowing knight d5, but in reality, that's a bad move. So let's take a look at knight d7. How can white continue his attack? Well, continue pushing the pawns. An obvious move is g5, and that's the right move. And now you might ask a question, OK, what about now g5? Because there is no e5, knight is now controlling that square. Doesn't just black blow up the center? That's a good question. So let's take a look at this position. If white plays h5, it does appear that it's a bit slow, because black can now play either d takes e, knight c5, or e5, and try to get his game. But an interesting idea that came to my mind is g6. This is, by the way, a very typical way of opening up the enemy king in these types of structures. Now, f takes g is impossible because e6 is hanging. The right move is to play h takes g. And now, white plays h5. So as you see, white just sacrificed a pawn. But no matter what black does, white is going to open up either the g file or the h file, after which all of white's threats are going to be really, really powerful. So this is quite an interesting idea to sacrifice a pawn, and white gets a very, very strong attack. So that's what I was trying to play in the game, but Alex surprised me with e5. Now, after knight f5, it turns out that it's not so easy for black to play d5, because right now it loses after bishop b6. Queen takes b6. And after knight takes e7, white simply wins in exchange. So d5 is not possible. 
and Alex plays rook d7 with the idea to prepare d5. But notice that it's another loss of a tempo. How can I take advantage of that move? Well, I can start by playing h5, which is a possible variation. Now, g5, I don't like because of knight h5, and my attack comes to screeching halt. Another interesting move that I played during the game is bishop g5, with a simple idea of knight takes e7. So that means black has to waste another tempo on bishop d8. Now, g5 is coming up. Bishop on g5 is not really well placed because it's blocking the pawns. How can I win a tempo and at the same time roll my pawns? Well, the answer is simple. Don't be afraid to give up the bishop for the knight. And that's what I did. And win an important tempo g5. So you see how it all makes sense. White is trying to get his pawns rolling as fast as possible. So bishop goes back to e7. And now I just play h5. So I am ready to open up the king with g6. But the game is not over yet. Because now black plays d5. Although it's a little bit late. But nevertheless black is ready to open up the center. And there is no time of wasting for white. I play g6 right away. And now we actually get something interesting. There is a lot of different possibilities to take on e4, to take on g6, or to simply black and ignore all of that and play bishop f6. So let's take a look, for example, pawn takes e4. Now, if I take with pawn takes e4, that's a possible move because bishop takes e4 is not a threat. After knight takes e7, I win a piece. So that's a possibility. And how does black continue the plan? What about another possibility here? His pawn takes h7 check. Probably king h8. And now I can play queen to g2. Hitting the pawn, forcing bishop G, uh, to f6, and simply recapturing with the pawn. And this is the position that I was trying to strive for. Now I got the open g file, and white really has a powerful attack, while black has no plan, no play, and basically has to defend his position. Let's see what happened in the game. So after g6, by the way, taking on g6 is really bad, opening up files. Black plays bishop f6, trying to solidify his game. I took king h8, and I simply played queen g2. And after pawn takes, pawn takes, we just transposed to the same variation. So as you see, this is reached by force. And now it's time for black to think about defending the g7 pawn. And black plays queen to d8 with the plan to play queen f8 and trying to create some kind of defensive stand on the king side. I play rook h to g1, attacking the g7 pawn, queen f8. And now, here is another question for you. Almost of all of white pieces are ideally placed. How does white continue his attack? Ideally, we want to triple up on the g-file, but it's not so easy. Because rook f1, rook f3, and rook g3, that's three moves. At the same time, black can try to create some threats. So what I really figured out is that I want to put pressure on the f6 bishop. with the possibility of playing h6. And so I want to have my rook on the f-file. 
So that's a good starting point. Not only am I threatening to play rook f3, rook g3, I'm threatening to jump with my knight or play h6 at the right moment to create pressure on the f6 bishop. So you see this is a multi-purpose move. So black doubles up on the d-file and creates a nasty threat. Now rook f3 loses after bishop takes e4 and I cannot recapture due to the back rank mate on d1. But the good thing is that I have a very nice jump with my knight to h6. And this is exactly what I was trying to plan for when I played the rook to f1. Now, of course, taking on h6 is bad because rook takes f6 would put black in a lot of, if not lost position, a lot of trouble. That's why Alex plays rook to d6. Well, and now the whole idea of knight h6 is to play knight g4 and to get rid of that powerful def defensive bishop on f6. Now, also the threat is to play h6, which would win right away. So bishop c8, attacking the knight is the only move. And now simply knight takes f6, rook takes f6, rook takes, one takes, and we reach this position. It does appear that white is better. Not only does he have an extra pawn, but white has all the chances to continue the attack because of the open g file and the weak f6 pawn. But really it's not so easy because everything is defended. The end games are quite good for black after queen g8 check because the bishop on d3 is a bad piece and pawn on h5 is going to get weak, whereas black can open up the position with f5. So the problem here for black is the constant threat of queen to g7 mate. So queen has to be on f8 at all times when our white is doubled up on the g-file. So that's an important piece of information. So queen is basically pinned down. What about black's rook? Well, black's rook is also pinned down because if the rook moves to, let's say, d7 or d6, anywhere in the d-file, queen g8 simply wins. It's a mate. So the only piece that can move here for black is bishop. So for example, bishop e6. But really, black doesn't have that much of a choice. So what th this all means is that black is, is some kind of a zugzwang, right? So that means white can find some kind of plan to try to activate his pieces in a way that will break through this fortress that black just created. So that's exactly what I was trying to do. So for the next few moves, I was trying to pressure black and at the same time to see if I can get something going on attack. So I start with queen f3. So okay, the forced move now, because rook g8 is a threat, is queen e7. Now, by the way, notice that there is a nice little combination after queen h6. The combination starts with the move rook g6. x clam second the rook. Pawn takes, queen takes f6 check, king h7. Now, if queen takes d8 right away, this is bad because queen takes h5, threatening mate on h1. So I cannot allow that to happen, that's why I give a check first. Now, queen g7. Again, taking the rook is bad because pawn takes h5, opens up the queen and the threat queen g1. So I have to make another tempo move. Pawn takes g6, check. And now, after king takes g6, I pick up the rook. The bishop is under attack, and white is simply up a pawn and should be easily winning here. So this nice neat, nice, neat combination could have happened after queen h6. So the correct move is queen e7. And now, 
I simply repeated the position with queen g3, except my queen now has a plan. So let's take a look. After queen f8, I play queen f2. And I'll show you shortly why I'm doing these queen dances. Queen e7. Now I play h6, trying to force black to take on h7. So I can put my rook on g7 with check. King h8. This is the only move. King takes pawn, loses. I just simply move my rook back. And there is no defense against either queen h4 mate or anything on the h file. So king h8 is the only move. And now the dances with the queen are explained after move queen g1. And the reason why I wanted my queen to be on g1, so I can set up this nice little trick. After queen f8, the retreat rook to g2. That's the whole reason why I need my queen on g1. And the reason why I want my rook on g2 is so that after black plays some move, such as bishop e6, I have a winning move h7. So this is my trick. Now threatening rook g8, so forcing black to take on h7. And now I just win simply after rook h3 check. And the game is over. So, the correct move, of course, is king h7. And black doesn't fall for the trick. But that's okay. Notice that I just made 40 moves. So now I can sit tight and try to figure out a winning plan. And that's exactly the advice I want to give to everyone. Whenever you have an overwhelming advantage, but you don't see quite how to win. Instead of trying to force things, you want to finish the time control, relax, you know, maybe go uh, get up from the chair, get something to eat, get something to drink, like a snack, and then come back at the game and simply try to figure out your plan, how to break through the fortress. So I, I go back, rook g7 check, king h8, and now... I noticed that a lot of variations my king on b1 feels uncomfortable. So I just create a little window, a3. For now, so that my king can move. So black simply plays bishop e6. And again, I have to figure out how to continue my initiative. I want to play b3. I just felt like I need my king to be on b2 so that I can move my bishop. Because right now, I can, my bishop has to move to only e2 square because of the back rank mate if bishop f1. So I really want my bishop to be able to move not just e2, but f1 as well. And that's why I felt king on b2 is much better placed. And especially in the end game, since king can go to c3 and b4. So right now, b3 is bad due to bishop takes pawn. But now I do some more dancing with the queens. Queen f2, queen e7, queen g3, queen f8. Now that the bishop is defended, I simply play b3. As you see, the pawn on a3 is untouchable because rook h7 and queen g7 mate. So black simply has to make moves. And my opponent plays rook b8. Possibly with the idea to play a5 and try to get some pawn, pawns rolling on the queen's, queen side. I simply play king b2. Now, I'm not afraid of a5 and b4 because I can meet that with a4. Or a5 and a4 is met by b4 at all times. And now rook c8. Not quite seeing how white can break through. So let's see. My king is nicely placed. My queen and rook are probably best placed. 
But how can I break through to win this game? And the answer is simple. My bishop is now free to go anywhere. And the key piece that I have to exchange is the bishop on e6. So that my queen can go to e f5 square. Or if black takes with the f pawn on e6, the queen can go to the g6 square. After which the game is over. And so the winning move is bishop f1. And that's what I played at the game. And it now turns out that the queen doesn't move for black because queen c5 loses after rook h7 and queen g7 made. And if black makes some move with the rook, such as rook c7 or rook d8, bishop h3 is a deadly move. So that's why black tries to create something going with b4. In reality, it's basically just a desperation attempt. Pawn takes b4. Rook b8. And bishop h3. And now black resigned. Because if bishop takes, queen takes, queen b4, really, there is not much black can do after queen f5, there's only one check, and I can simply play king h2. The game is over. If black doesn't take on h3, so for example, if rook takes b4, bishop takes e6, pawn takes, notice that after queen g6, again, Black is completely lost because there is no defense against mate. So you see how simple it was to find the winning plan if you have enough time, if you just simply think about your position, see how you can improve your structure, and then you can find the winning plan. So this is the game that I think was my best game at this tournament, the American Open, and I beat one of the very strong grandmasters, Alex Yermolinsky. So thank you, and I hope to see you all in my next lecture.